in some really nice uh, ambience today on the roof. There's like this nice sizzle, makes the, the worship sound awesome. more ethereal and ambient. Yes, very heavenly this morning. Thank you guys for joining us. Can you guys stand and, and uh, worship along with us, please. Resolution, huh? Just begin deeper than deep, 
won't find the edges of you. You're our eternity, infinite destiny. Go on forever with you. Won't find the edges of you deeper than deep, brighter than bright, more than our words could ever do to describe. Have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Element. My name is Justine and I am our eLittles coordinator and our city liaison. Um, I'm doing the announcements today and I just wanted to start by saying whether you are joining us online or in person, we are so grateful you are here, especially if you are new. If you are here with us this morning for the first time, you will find two cards behind the seats in front of you. One is for you to keep and tells you a little bit more about who we are. The other one is for you to fill out so we can know you are here. You can either place those in the offering boxes by the doors or come say hello to us at the Welcome Center after the service. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and get to know you. If you're joining us virtually, you can see our digital connect card linked to this video or say hello to us in the chat area. The biggest thing to know about us is that we love Jesus. Jesus. Our hope is that when you think about Element, you think of a people who love Jesus and strive to connect more people to him. We aim to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community, and planting churches. Yes, it's that time of year again, our quarterly missions update. Please find a copy of the update on a seat around you, or you can find the extras on the back communion table or at the Welcome Center. Here at Element, we are involved in a lot of local organizations and good causes and a few global missions too. We have recently been receiving more community organizations reaching out for help from us. We realize there is much need everywhere and we do not expect everyone to do everything, but we do like to present opportunities for serving here in our own church body and in our local community, as well as the world at large. However, we all have various seasons of life and availability and different talents and opportunities in front of us. So take a look and see if any of these catch your eye. But also remember, don't forget to go, go outside and say hi to your neighbors or start being intentional about connecting with a coworker or befriending a parent on your kid's soccer team. There are people everywhere around us who need Jesus, and many times they are right in front of us. So while all of these opportunities are great, let it not replace us being intentional in our daily lives with the people we are around. We have the mission graphic on the inside page to remind us all that as disciples of Christ, God calls us to disciple one another, witness to others, and help meet needs in the world. That being said, the need is large everywhere, and we have streamlined how we determine which organizations we give to financially. Please see the inside of the flyer to see some of our reasoning. We heavily focus on church planting efforts, which include Tom and Jing in Thailand, the Pruitts with Ethnos 360 in Arizona, and the Antioch Church Plant in Slow. Then we focus giving on Delta and pro-life organizations such as Karanut, Casa of Hope, Captive Hearts, and the Tamar Center. We give to other organizations also, but these are our main focus currently. So to highlight a few quick things from the update, please join us for a time of putting together Valentine goodie bags for all the Delta students. We've been doing this for the past couple years. Usually it's, we're assembling 300 bags, um, and we individually write their names on each card um, with each bag. So it's fun and it actually goes fairly quickly. So if you'd like to help us, please join us in the barn on Monday night, February 12th at 5.30. Next, we have a really big praise from Thailand. Remember, as a church body, we have been able to sponsor 20 teens this past year to be able to stay in high school and to be mentored by Tom and Jing this school year. Well, eight students have come to follow Jesus through this program this year, and that apparently is not common with that age group in this area. So we are so happy that we get to be a part of their ministry and these kids' lives. You can see one of the stories that Jing sent us about one of the boys in the scholarship program that's written in the flyer. 
It's really incredible how the Lord is working in this little community in Thailand, and we are hoping um, to send a group of people from Element to visit and support them for about a week, maybe sometime this fall, um, possibly September or October. So if you have any interest in possibly being a part of that trip, please reach out to me so we can start putting a team together. Again, there's a lot of information and opportunities, so take the flyer home and pray for these different ministries and consider how you might get involved. All right, now if you could um, take a moment and greet one another. First off, it's good to see you because I was reading this article and it said that the number one reason people decide to go to, not that today's a funeral, but a funeral or not, is the weather. Is the weather. It's too hot, too cold, too rainy, too windy. You guys brave the elements. I know Jesus went to the cross for you. You can brave some elements. I, that's, that's not a dig if you're watching online. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, things just come out of my mouth. The staff tells me this all the time to stop it. Okay, I have one thing to tell you about, and that is at 12.30 today, we have a business meeting. And I know you're thinking, whoo, sounds like so much fun, a business meeting. Well, this one is going to be different than other years. We tried to revamp how we do it to really give you an idea of everything that's taking place at Element. And you will get some numbers and stuff at the end of, of all that if, you, if you're into that. But we're going to really try and just give you a state of Element and where we were at. So I would encourage you, if you are so inclined and you can make it back to the hurricane, you can come back at 1230 and it's going to be an hour tops. And there is actually a little thing in there that's kind of exciting that's going to be at the very end. You're going to walk away going, I got a bunch of questions, which is okay, which is okay. Just not today. Uh, and I, seriously, just come back at 1230. We tried to really change it up so that everybody can get just a kind of a in the know of where we're at. So put that down. If you're new to Element, welcome. And if you did show up for the first time today, wow, way to go. Uh, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. The communion tables are just these metal tables around the room. They look like this. And on the front, you're going to get the verses we're covering. Underneath that, you get a little place to write some questions if you have them. On the inside, you get a little recap of what we will talk about today. And on the back, you get a place for notes. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Version. Once you download it, it just says Bible. Click on more and then events. When you get in there, we'll come up by GPS in your smart device and you will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word. This is Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 through 10. And yes, I did read these to you last week. Don't worry. We're going to go all the way through verse 14 today. 
7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would move us to a place where we understand your sovereignty and your providence and your grace, that we would see what you are doing, maybe not today, but one day we look back and see all the ways you are moving things together to bring us into your hands and to love us and draw us to yourself. And we ask that through that we would glorify you as we worship you for who you are, as you teach your people what true joy really is. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are going through the New Testament book of Ephesians. This is week four, and today I will finally finish those first 14 verses. I know it's been a, a little bit, and then we'll move on. If you have a Bible, open to Ephesians chapter one. That's on page 633 if you're using one of the Bibles at Element. Now, in the Greek text, as I keep telling you, that verse 3 through 14 is one long sentence, really one long prayer. And it's like Paul is so excited about what he is talking about here, he doesn't have time for punctuation. He'll start and end with essentially praise God. In the middle, it's like, and then, and then, and th no, and then, and then, and then, and then right through it, how good God is, what he has done, and why Paul's so excited. And maybe you are someone who has believed in Jesus in your life 5, 10, 20, 50 years ago, and sometimes you feel like your faith is maybe fading. Where's the vitality in that? Well, what Paul is doing for these people is reminding them first and foremost who God is. And when we come back to the foot of the cross and what he has done, that begins to change us. It brings an excitement because we see what he first did for us. And when you look at this book, you will see that just like the church in Ephesus, the same thing today, we have three types of people in the church. There are people who are non-Christian people who have not trusted Jesus with their life. And if that is you, I would encourage you today to listen as God speaks and as he moves and as he works that you would trust in him for your hope and your salvation. And there are also committed Christians, but those people every single day still need to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ, to trust in his spirit, to be filled with his spirit so we live out the great love that was first given to us. And then there are, which I would say probably most of us, Christians who many feel like they are overcome and overwhelmed by a lot of things that distract us in the world from our call to Christ. And we all end up here multiple times in our lives. And so Paul is saying, let's start in the place where we see the magnificence of who God is, the beauty of what he has done, the glory that he himself has. And so these last weeks, I've broken this out piece by piece by piece because I didn't want you to get distracted. So today we're going to pull it all together. And I'm going to start by reading the entire thing. Are you ready? If you weren't, I'm doing it anyway. Okay. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And do you see why we he had to stop right there and like walk through that because that is so much. Paul doesn't stop. There's not a period in the text. Just keep going. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." Wow. I mean, just wow. I mean, Peter O'Brien, he wrote this. This is the most monstrous sentence conglomeration I have ever found in the Greek language. Yes. Yes, it is. That's why we had to break it up. And Paul was trying to get us to see something. Who Jesus is, 
what Jesus does. And I have so many things I've been going through in the book of Ephesians, reading before we got to it. And I don't know if it was like John Piper or Kent Hughes or Tim Keller or N.T. Wright, uh, but somebody said, it's kind of like if you take a person out of a third or a fourth world country and you drop them down into New York City, they would just be lost. It's like random chaos. I've been there, it feels like random chaos, and I'm not from the third or fourth world. Some people think Santa Maria is, but no. Okay. Um, you got billboards and shop fronts and noises and sounds and people buying hot dogs and walking down stairs into the belly of the earth and hopping on like a metal centipede that takes you somewhere else and drop you back off and you walk back out of there. It's like, what is going on? I don't understand any of it. It seems like there is no purpose to it at all, like it's senseless. But if you lived in one of those cities, it doesn't look senseless at all. Uh, maybe a little bit, but it doesn't look senseless at all. And this is how it is when you first come. And you look at Paul's prayer with all of these words and all of these things that he says. And this is why we spent these last couple weeks talking about mystery and predestination and God being sovereign in all things. See, when we're young and we start to grow up, we think everything in life is just going to work out right, how we want it to. But the older you get, you realize things just kind of look a little bit random. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I don't understand these things over there. Life doesn't go how we think when we're little. In the scientific community, they will tell you now at the core, the universe seems to be some randomness, has design, but there is some randomness to it that they really don't know what's gonna happen and all the laws that they make up aren't always consistently fo followed. Uh, Stephen Hawking said this, there's no rhyme or reason to it, life is chaotic, history is chaotic, it's nothing but disorder. And when I read that, that is total audacity because that is a fourth world person standing in the grandeur of the universe, of God's creation, of not understanding it because we're so finite, not understanding it and saying, if I can't figure it out, therefore it doesn't make sense. It's all about me. And that's not what we are people like a fourth world country in the middle of New York City and God is showing us these things. We're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And it takes some time to walk through it. We will spend the majority of our lives walking through these concepts, understanding deeper and deeper what they mean. And if something has kind of rocked your world over the last couple of weeks, that's great because it means you're starting to work through certain things in your theology, to work through understanding who God really is. See, Christianity has the greatest answer to our perspective perception in the world. And it's found in this text in Ephesians. And if you want to whittle it down in a nutshell, it is this, Jesus is King. That's it right there. It's like if you found a person from a fourth world country wandering around New York City, you could sit them down and say, look, I can't explain everything to you and I can't do it quickly at this moment, but you can calm down because there is an explanation. There is a reason behind it all. And the Bible says when our lives or history look chaotic, we can calm down as well because there is an explanation. We're not going to understand it in an instant. It may take us years or decades or maybe it's after we're dead and gone and centuries later we look back and we see these certain things that were happening but key to it all is the kingship of Christ now the kingship of Christ has two aspects to it and they have to be part of what we believe and this is what we're going to pull this together with and if we don't understand the two sides of that kingship they're not identical they exist together if we don't understand them we're going to be like that person plopped down in the middle of a city not understanding it and it really starts and comes to this idea of Ephesians 1 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known, the mis making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. This is something that has been done. And then a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And this is what we call a theology of the already and the not yet the already and the not yet, and how they begin to come together. So this is day three of theology. I hope you're with me today. Every single one of these weeks, someone has said, this is a lot. Imagine if I didn't break it up. You'd be like, I'm just not listening anymore, buzz. So day three of theology, let's start with this. First off, Jesus has a coming kingdom. There is a future aspect to his kingdom. Oh, this is gonna be a fun day, isn't it? <laughs> So this future aspect of his kingdom, this is the not yet, the not yet. So one of the people I was reading said, it's like God makes the universe. 
like a clockmaker makes a clock. And if the universe was a clock, you open up the back, you'd see the way it was originally designed, and there would be humanity right in the middle of it, meshing everything together, because that's how God designed it. God above, nature below, humanity in the middle. We were meant to be God's vice regents in the world. We would rule on behalf of him. But what we did is we took the word vice out of regent and tried to make ourselves our own king. And so we tried to rule on our own without him. And when that happened, the cogs start to fall off the wheels. The clock broke. And so the universe, you see exactly what happens if you take that center gear out of a clock. The universe begins to smoke and crack and grind and splinter. And one thing that scientists and theologians agree on both is that the nature of life, the universe, physically, socially, spiritually, culturally, it's all deteriorating. We call this entropy. And everything's in the process of falling apart. And we are told from the Bible that God knows this. It's not a surprise to who he is, but God has allowed this tragedy to work itself out because of decisions that we have made. He lets us take the consequences, but he also promised to not let us stew in that forever. He promised that someday he would set up a brand new kingdom. He would put humanity where they belong, right back in the middle of the clock. And when that happens, everything will be healed socially, physically, spiritually, in every way. Everything will come together again. And this is the not yet. That's the not yet. Now, what is already seen is our redemption in Jesus, but it's not yet in terms of the fullness of those promises. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. This is where Jesus takes over in our lives. The father plans our salvation. Jesus comes and he accomplishes it. He comes to earth and he redeems us. That means Jesus purchases our salvation in its entirety all at once. Now, when you use this word redemption, sometimes people hear this word and all they think is forgiveness. I got to get my sins forgiven. I love to sin. God loves to forgive. It's a match made in heaven. This is wonderful. God, I'm sorry. God says, okay. But it's so much more than that. Because imagine if God only forgave you for your sins up to the point that you said, God, I'm sorry, forgive me for my sins. Imagine if that what, what's what it was like. God only forgave you to that point. As soon as you sinned again, you'd have to ask for forgiveness again and again and again. I have this friend I was close to for years. I haven't talked to him in years, but he had this idea that if he sinned and walked outside and got hit by a car, he was going to go to hell. It was like I, he, he walked around in fear all the time in his life. See, when you understand your relationship with God as like that, it's always hanging by a thread. There's always this fear. What's God going to do? Is that a sin? Is that a sin? How do I got to figure this out? And if you died at the moment you asked for forgiveness, well then, hey, you get to go be with God. You get to go to, to heaven. But if seriously, if this is the case, it would be like 15 seconds. And I'd be asking for, for one second and I'd be asking for forgiveness again. That's how it works. But see, none of us could or would ever be redeemed. Jesus did not only forgive us, though we do get forgiveness in him, but he redeemed us. The full price for our sin was paid at the moment of the cross. All of your sins, past, present, and future. All of your sins when Jesus died were in the future. They are all paid for, period. We get forgiveness, but Jesus has settled the score for our salvation forever in him. But we do not see the full culmination. Now, last year, I started watching football. Not like these crazy football players, but I actually, people like, who are you? Because I used to not like sports at all. And so now I'm watching football and I really enjoy it. I know people's names. Something happens on the field. I can be like, oh, they're going to call this. It's like, how do you know that? I don't know. I'm a weirdo now. But some people are really weird about football where they will like DVR the games. And it's like, don't tell me the score. I don't want to know. I'm going to go home and watch it. Okay, I'm going to give you a spoiler, okay? Because I'm going to tell you the score. It is settled. Jesus wins. Okay, Jesus won. That's the score right there. He is triumphant. He is king. He has a coming kingdom. And that changes how we battle with things in our lives now. Things you struggle with, things that frustrate you. You know he wins, so you can trust in that. If you knew the score of a game and you're watching the DVR playback and you know your team wins and some the other team gets the ball and runs it back like 70 yards for a touchdown, you're not freaking out. Because you know the score. You know how it ends. Jesus won. That's what Paul is talking about. This is God's ultimate purpose. The point of history, which he set forth in Christ as the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. And that means 
everything that is disunited and disintegrated will be united and integrated again. God is bringing it together, making it whole. Christ is king. And there is a moment in the future when everything reaches its fulfillment, everything is united and healed. But it's not yet. It's not yet. Second thing, he is king of history right now. This is the already. Sometimes it may not look like it. Sometimes it may not feel like it. One person says, he may not have put down all resistance to himself yet, but history has no resistance to him. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Now this is really interesting because in the Greek text, Paul writes this and you see the already and the not yet both coming together. Jesus is in charge of history, him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Paul will actually bring this all together next week spoiler for next week, chapter 1, verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. He's saying that though you may not see Jesus crowned right now, he is crowned over all. Yes, there is brokenness in the world. Yes, there is physical imperfection. There is pain. There is suffering. But right now, it is being steered by the king. Verse 9, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Everything that happens, Every event he will use for his glory and our good. Every single thing, his plan, his purpose. The word plan here has the idea of like a blueprint of how God is working it all together, healing the universe. And unless we understand the already and the not yet, those two things together, things will begin to seem out of control. So someone will say, well, if he is king over everything and everything that's happening is according to his purpose, does that mean he planned earthquakes and tsunamis and country music, yeah. things like that, right? If Jesus is king, why is there suffering in the world? And we have to take a step back, and it's not a dig at anybody because we all start here, but that's kind of like a fourth world person standing in the large city and not seeing how sophisticated the answer is to this because Jesus' kingship does not have one aspect, it has two. It right now has a plan to get us to the place where there are no more earthquakes, no more killing, no more death. He is taking us there. But certain things happen in that unfolding. Here's an example. Go back 2,000 years. Jesus Christ is crucified. That looks like utter nonsense. God would come in the flesh. He'd be the Messiah. The Messiah would let human beings lay their hands on him and crucify him. That makes no sense whatsoever. Even though God throughout the Old Testament scripture kept saying the Messiah is a suffering servant. He'll be whipped and stripped and beaten for our iniquities. All these things will happen, but nobody saw that. They thought, oh, the Messiah was only going to come in power. But if Jesus didn't come and do what he did, we'd still be offering sacrifices at the temple. We wouldn't have this relationship with God that we can today. We wouldn't be living in all of this grace of having all of our sins paid for, past, present, and future. And there's so many things on that road to learning that sometimes your head just goes, I can't really even get it all. That's okay. That's the process that we're in. God is taking us to the place where there is no more pain, but the road to get to that place where there's no pain passes through pain. Uh, one person said it goes really straight through the cross. And in many cases, if it wasn't for our troubles and the things that we go through, many of us wouldn't come to the place where we know God. He is steering us to the place where there are no more earthquakes, yet he takes us through earthquakes to get there. One writer says it like this. I think it was Tim Keller. He's steering us to the place where there are no more crosses, where there is nothing but crowns, but on the way he himself had to go through a cross. Now, a lot of people will say, but why doesn't he just bring the culmination right now? Well, you say that because you're a believer. Because you're like, oh, I'm saved. Yeah, it's very selfish. Because like, I don't know. I don't want to wait for anybody else. Let's just do it now. God is patient. God wants people to come to him. He is drawing them. And if he didn't wait till you were saved, you'd be like, why not me? See, he is patient. He is good. Tim Keller calls it the dad, are we there yet syndrome? Like you're going somewhere and it's like, are we there yet? I have friends, they take their, their smaller kids to this place called Great Wolf Lodge. I've never had a desire, uh, seen the commercial, uh, but they take their kids there and it's like a couple hours away. Are we there yet? Just, we're, we're going to get there. You said you were taking me here. I'm tired. I want to be there. You said it's going to be wonderful and great. Why aren't we there yet? Why is it taking so long? 
And so God keeps trying to explain to us, like we're that four-year-old in the back of the car. And sometimes with the four-year-old, you probably end up saying, look, you're four. You don't understand the workings of the universe, all these physics. All I can tell you is fasten your seatbelt. Be a little more quiet. <laughs> we're we're going to get there. God kind of says this. Be still and know that I am God. Just trust me. Trust me in this. I was reading one commentary and this guy said this. If Jesus Christ is king, it makes sense that not everything makes sense. Yes. Yes. I should just you tattoo that. Uh, not on me, but you know, at some point. He's, he's taking us to the place where Jesus fills all things. Yet meanwhile, everything that happens is getting us to that place. Everything that happens is designed to move us to the place where we see Jesus is king. Him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This doctrine historically has been called the doctrine of God's providence. Providence comes from the word to provide. God is providing everything that happens. God provision is tied up in this word, all things. Now, all things in the Greek text, it translates as all things. See? See how great that is right there? So this is, this is going to blow your mind a bit. So God's plan, first off, includes the little things, the little things. Are you single? Are you married? Are you widowed? Are you divorced? What career? What school do you go to? God's plan includes all of it. And therein lies our security. Second thing is God's plan also includes our choices. It does include our choices. Uh, this isn't fatalism. Uh, the Greeks taught a fatalism and the Romans taught a fatalism. Muslims teach a fatalism of a sort called kismet. But in fatalistic system of thought, everything is fixed and it doesn't matter. Christianity, though, is actually different. And this is one of the things that kind of blows our minds. Christianity says everything is part of God's plan. He weaves it all together, including our choices. So God's plan comes about fixed even through our choices, even the bad ones, everything, not in spite of, which means our choices are also part of this plan. So in Genesis, you have this guy named Jacob. Jacob robs from his brother and he sins against his father and his brother's like a gigantic Yeti and he's going to rip Jacob's arms off and he's like, run away. So he, so he runs away. And as a result, he lives in a foreign land and he's lonely. He ends up at that place finding this woman he falls in love with. Her name is Rachel. Rachel. And so he starts this sheep shearing business and he's got all these sheep and he works seven years for a bride price for Rachel. On his wedding day, he gets a little too inebriated. It's dark. He goes in and he ends up consummating the marriage with Rachel's sister, Leah, who nobody wanted. There's a lot of references in the book of Genesis that talk about that. Uh, Leah, you know, he'll work another seven years and get Rachel. But what happens is Leah, this girl who is unwanted and unloved, she will have a son named Judah total knucklehead till God gets a hold of his life as well. But Judah, out of his line, generations later, will come Jesus. And what you see is that God didn't cause the sin. He didn't make anybody sin, but he used everybody's failings in this to bring about his ultimate plan. The sin was the free choice of Jacob. Nobody coerced him, but God still uses it as part of his plan. God weaves it together. You guys ever seen these, these tapestries, like in castles? Uh, we went on a tour of the Vatican years ago, and they have these huge tapestries on the wall. And what you see in these tapestries is just beautiful and all these colors on the front side. If you look at the back of a tapestry, it's all snags and snarls, and it's ugly and knots all tied together. One person said that we are a people who live under the loom. We see the back side of the tapestry. All we see is the snags and the snarls, and on the front side, God is weaving it all together every single bit of it. Charles Spurgeon went to see a friend of his who was sick. And he says, hey, how you doing? And his friend says, I don't know if I should take my medicine. And Charles Spurgeon says, why not? And his friend said, well, I don't know if God has destined me to live or to die. And so he says, my friend, look, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. You take your medicine, you're destined to live. You don't take your medicine, you're destined to die. <laughs> and it's funny because everything can be woven into part of God's plan. And it makes perfect sense, even though our minds can't really even get our head around it. And your mind right now, now it's probably going, what? Yes, which leads to number three. God's plan does include everything, his control, his kingship over history, everything, including the bad things. And there is no greater example of this in the Old Testament than this guy named Joseph. Joseph is Jacob's son through his loved wife, Rachel. And because it's his, from this woman, he just spoils this kid rotten. This kid is a complete brat, tattletelling on his brothers, and his brothers get sick of it. So one day his brothers throw him in a pit and then they sell him into slavery. My brother and I did some really mean things to each other growing up. Never this. Okay, so Joseph, 
becomes the slave of a man named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife sees Joseph, thinks he's attractive, and says, hey, you need to come sleep with me. And Joseph says, no, I'm not going to do that. Now, what's interesting is she will then say, he raped me. They will throw Joseph in jail. But in that culture, if you tried to rape your master's wife, most of the time you would be killed. So Potiphar must have known something was going on. I also assume Potiphar's wife was like, a slave shouldn't say no to me. She's going to be embarrassed. So I'll just say you raped me instead. He gets thrown into jail for his 20s. If you were in your 20s, love this time, okay? Your hair goes out of the top of your head and not out of your ears or your nose or your eyebrows like you're trying to give birth to an albino cat, okay? It's, it's amazing. Love your 20s. He spends his 20s in jail. And in those 20s, God teaches him grit and wit and character, he learns that God is with him and he trusts God. Joseph is eventually brought out of jail and through a bunch of different circumstances, he rises essentially to become the prime minister of Egypt. And he realizes a famine is coming. And so he creates this grain reserve program so when the famine hits, instead of everybody starving, everybody survives. And it all came about because there was sin after sin after sin after sin and God wove all of those things together. He used everything to bring about his ultimate purpose. The whole time Joseph was gone, Jacob, his dad, is sitting there very sad. He keeps saying, everything is against me. My son is dead. Woe is me. Woe is the world. And that is how your life will look unless you understand the already and the not yet. Unless you understand both of those things and how they come together. See, God knows more than us. If we refuse to believe that he is king and believe that he is good, we're going to look a lot like Jacob. We don't make Jesus king. He is king. Whether you believe it or not, he will move all things to his end because there is no middle ground where we get to be our own gods. Verse 13, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. See, with Jesus being king, understanding our place, how he works, how we are saved, we are sealed, we can come to the place of trusting him in every moment and every part of our lives. And like last week, I think there are some things that we can learn from this, that will, from this great truth that help us to live in the already, not yet. It brings certain things. I'm gonna give you five really quick. The first one is this, it brings an assurance. It brings an assurance because salvation begins in God, is accomplished by Him, which means He will finish it. And if there are times we can be really honest about this, our personal decisions can overwhelm us. They really can because we are typically self-centered and we can start to ask, how could I possibly be saved? I have talked to people who have said this, like, have you seen my life and the decisions I make? How can I be saved? But it is Jesus, our King, who started the great saving work and he is the one who drew us even when we weren't seeking him and he is the one who will finish it. We should all thank God that he has always been more committed to our salvation than we ever have. Seriously, guys, one person said, if I could lose my salvation, I most surely would have. Me too. Me too. I would say that. Every Christian I know struggles at different places in their lives. And sometimes that struggle is because the closer we get to God, we see how wicked our hearts are and the sin in our life. Knowing who God is from Ephesians chapter 1, from these 11 verses we've looked at for the last three weeks, that should deliver us from that fear. What God started, God is going to finish. Already, not yet. A good shepherd brings his sheep back. He saves them from themselves. And if the shepherd heads out with a hundred sheep in the morning, he comes back with a hundred sheep in the evening. And Jesus is our good shepherd. He loses none. And that should give you assurance. The second thing it should understand is we get to live in power. And when I say power, I'm not talking like He-Man and the power of Grayskull. It's not like a superhero, but it gives us a truth that when we fall down, when we fail, we have the strength, the power to stand up again because it's His strength in us. Even if your yesterday is consumed by defeat, even if you're today on the way down, you're, it's just like you're arguing with your friend or your spouse or your kids or with yourself or with the radio or the talk radio. Ah! When you get here, you understand that God's decree for your tomorrow is victory in Him. It's been won. You DVR'd the game. You know the score. That's what it is. It is won. That means the burden of fixing your life is not on you. 
It's not on you. God has already decreed it. He has supplied the power for it. And one way or another, it is going to happen. See, the picture of a Christian life is not a rule book. And I have talked to people recently about this, about how they think, oh, I don't want to read the Bible. It's just a book of rules. You haven't read the Bible. The Bible is not a book of rules. The Bible is about the kingship of Christ. The Bible does not sit there and say, oh, you got to figure out how to get over your lust or be bold like a Christian and fix your marriage. It's not about fixing your problems. The whole point of the scripture is to point to Jesus is king, the kingship of Christ in all things. And if you have a struggle in your life and you say, oh, I can't win this battle. Guess what? You're right. You're right. You can't. You shouldn't go into a battle feeling you have to win it, but believing that he will win it through you. It's already done. It's already done. That yearning to be victorious in our lives is really the call of God's spirit in us, I believe, because the spirit is crying out in us. And if he is doing that, then you can rest assured that what he starts, he will finish it's kind of like you get in an accident and you wake up in the back of an ambulance, got knocked out, it's like, Whoa, and the ambulance guy's like, look, you're in an accident, we got you, you're gonna be okay. You know, This is what God is doing. He is waking us up and he's like, look, I'm saving you. You may think you're beyond hope, but I am mighty to save. Which leads to the third thing, which is humility. You know why we become humble? Because all you did is wake up in the back of God's ambulance. That's all you did. It's like, what's happening? God's like, it's got you. We're good. I got you. We are not saved because we're more humble. We're more well-read, more open. According to Ephesians 1, the reason we are humble or open to Christ's work is God's seeking us. We are Christians by grace alone. And there is so much hope and freedom in that. Paul says we were chosen so God would glorify us in his grace or glorify himself in his grace given to us. With fourth brings hope. Hope, knowing that God is working in every area of your life, making you into his child, that brings hope. J.D. Greer once said, he has harnessed literally every molecule in the universe to that end. Because you don't ever have to do anything for him or to him to make him work for your good. And that should shatter any idea of fate or karma or luck or coincidence. C.S. Lewis said that in eternity, we're not going to look back in our lives and wonder about all the tragedy. Rather, he said, we will look at our lives and say, what bad things? Because we will see the other side of the tapestry. We'll see the top side of the loom. We are so consumed at that point with God's finished project, we will see everything in our lives at what he was doing to work these things together. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Already, not yet, coming together. And the fifth thing this will bring, I think, is a boldness into our lives. Boldness in living and sharing the gospel. See, the fact of God's sovereignty is why Paul had the confidence to be a witness like this. And when we think about God's sovereignty and his providence and his call, we start to ask questions like, well, then why do I have to go out and do anything? Why do I have to be bold? One person said that eating is the way that God has ordained that we should live. Well, sharing Christ with people and praying for them is the way that God has ordained people will be saved. Even though it's still his work, doing the work. It's like prayer. Sometimes people say, why prayer if God doesn't change, why pray if God doesn't change his mind? It's not about trying to change God's mind. You don't just go with the list. It's about deepening relationship. It's about communication and spending time with him and building that relationship with God. Sharing the gospel with others is living in relationship with God. So here are some questions that kind of come out of this. Do we live with the hope that God is working everything for his glory and our good? And in the places in our lives where we have temptation, do we fight temptation with the confidence that comes from knowing that God has already won the battle? You, know, you don't have to DVR it. You can know what's, what's happening. And do we share with boldness knowing that God is sovereign? Do we live that way? I mean, we can be a people who live confident in our salvation. We can develop a conviction of sin in our lives where we actually begin to lose the taste for it, where it doesn't taste as good. We can see the beauty of Christ. Our lives can begin to desire Him. And I would start to pray in your own life that your appetite would be to know Him. Because when that happens and God is moving you, that is Him drawing you to Himself. Already, not yet. Already, not yet. Not yet. And I love how Paul brings this together in this regard, these two things, because we are saved, but yet there is that not yet aspect of where everything will ultimately come to culmination. 
and we can trust that he will do it because he is good because he has shown himself to take everything over the course of millennia and continue to work every little piece together as he knits that loom into a beautiful tapestry. So he brings about what he ultimately intends. And this is one of the reasons every week at Element, we come to the place of communion as a reminder of God's grace first given to us. This is why you break a cracker like his body was broken. It's why you dip it in the wine or the grape juice. Because again, at the crucifixion, that would have made no sense. Like, what is God doing in this moment and in this place? What, what is happening? But now we look back after all this time, we think, oh my goodness, this is how God is saving us. This is how God is bringing us to himself. This is how he pays for our sins and draws us to himself in his own goodness and in his own grace. And we get to be the recipients of God's goodness. We get to be the recipients of that grace today already and an ultimate culmination in the not yet. And today when you take communion, I would hope that you'd remember that. Already, not yet. God is doing a work and we can trust him every moment of our lives. If you need prayer today, maybe you are living in a position in your life where it feels like everything is chaotic. It is out of control. You're like the fourth world person in the middle of New York City. And you want someone to pray with you to give you this wider perspective. You may not understand everything as most people don't throughout the course of our lives. We work through these things. But we can say, hey, there is a reason. There is a reason and God is good and he will bring all things to his ultimate glory and our ultimate good. And if you would like someone to pray with you about that, you, would sh you can share with and talk through. They would love to do that right across in the lounge. If you can make it through the wind tunnel, uh, right across the lounge, you can go during music, you can go after service, either way, but they'll be over there to pray with you. Uh, we are a church who gives, but not by sending out an offering plate. There's offering boxes on the side of the wall. You can give online, but we believe our giving is meant to be a response of God's great generosity to us. And that's why we give the way that we do, where you can put in the offering box, you can give online, but we don't pass a plate because we want to be a people who understand our response to God's great love first given to us. And I encourage you to maybe grab those sermon notes, take those questions that are in there and begin to walk through those. Uh, maybe with friends, gospel community, you know, maybe just on the way to work or back or on the way home from church today, and just kind of start walking through those and thinking about this already and then not yet. And how each of these pieces begin to come together to understand the full culmination of what God has done in Christ. And then what he also does in every single one of us. Again, even if we don't see it like, God, I don't know where you're taking me in this moment. God does. And we can trust him as we walk through each part of our lives with him. Because God is sovereign and he is good and he is providential and he has saved us by his grace. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that you would remind us of your goodness and the hope that we have. And that hope would come from this assurance of understanding who you are and what you have done. That that would bring us to a place to understand the power that's been placed into our lives. That when we fail, when we fall, when we stumble, we can get back up because it's you lifting us up. And what you have started, you will be the one to finish. And I ask in that we would start to live in humility. That there'd be a wisdom that comes from our humility that would see the things that come into our lives as being able to be woven together, again, for your glory and our ultimate good. And so I ask that as we, as a church community, as a people begin to work through all that we've talked about over the last three weeks, that you would have us first see your grace and love in it all. And that our trust in you would come to a place of fruition where our lives would be lived worshiping and glorifying you in all things. Father, we thank you that that word all things includes us. <laughs> 
And so today, remind us of the already and the not yet and this great hope we have because of your promises. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So we'd like you guys to do is maybe just take a moment, maybe during this first song, and just ask God, just as you start to work through these concepts of the already and the not yet, maybe the things that you don't understand, like God, show me where I'm kind of like the fourth world person standing in like downtown New York City, not understanding really anything and the places I have questions about. God, give me a peace to know that I can trust you even in the things I don't understand. And that in the backside of that with the already and not yet, that we would simply surrender our lives to him and we would trust that what he has said is true and that our lives can be those who live in strength, humility, hope, power, but also assurance of his great salvation given to his people. And we can walk out of this place assured of the hope and the joy and the grace that he provides. And then come and take communion, sing some songs with us, brave the winds on the way home <laughs> or wherever you're going today. And remember the already and the not yet. And that God is providential and he provides every part of our lives. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead and i will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no And the shadows disappear And my face shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won Ah! Uh -huh.
passion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. move the mountains our God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior he can mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And that if we are people who could lose our salvation, we most certainly would have. So we thank you that you are the one who is mighty to save. And that our salvation is not based upon our effort, our earning, our goodness. It is based upon yours. And so I ask that we would remember that. In those moments when we feel defeated, when we feel lost, when we feel like you are so disappointed in us. But typically, that's because we are disappointed in us. And so I ask that we would truly begin to see ourselves through the lens that you see us, which is the lens of your son. And that we would understand the hope of salvation that we have received and that we would live in it. Amen.
All right, may we live as a people who understand God's great grace given to us and that there is an already and a not yet and we can live in the hope of what he not only has done but will continue to do. So live in that hope. I think we have one more song. Sure do. It's an oldie, 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 it's oldie. It's pretty old. And a goodie. Is that an E chord? Yes. Okay, just make sure. <laughs> I have a broken key on my keyboard, so I have to like retune my keyboard so I don't hit that note, and it's really messing with my brains. First world problems. <laughs> First world problems. I wanted to say, uh, you know, getting into football is a gateway into country music. So is playing music with Mark Come on a Sunday now, morning. Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song. Sung by flaming tongues above, praise his name, I'm fixed upon it, name of thy redeeming love. <laughs> Here I raise my Ebenezer, hear the Bible. Find my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to Joining us this morning. Don't forget that uh, we have our business meeting after church today. Already not yet. Already not yet. <laughs> <laughs> One, two.